much. It's a um, pleasure to be here. Um, talk to all my colleagues about uh, uh, about the issue of uh, technology development and transfer, but from a slightly different perspective. In fact, I think just to be provocative, I now that I see what the previous talk was titled, I should have maybe labeled my talk why I think the technology mechanism is not going to do much for energy <laughs> development. Um, and I think it really comes back to the question of um, what's the problem we're trying to solve and how we're trying to solve it. Um, and so I'm going to present a somewhat different perspective on how does one organize oneself to um, tackle questions about around innovation in a developing country context to meet climate and energy challenges. And by the way, some of what I'm going to talk about can also, the same thinking can be used even for other developmental challenges. In fact, we're doing some of this work uh, in India along, along these lines. Let me, let me start very quickly uh, in a sense of the why, the what, and the how of this organization, or organizing for innovation. Um, why, why do we need to organize for innovation? And what do we want to organize for? Uh, I want to just start very briefly with a set of, uh, very brief set of energy and climate needs of developing countries relating to both mitigation and adaptation technologies uh, and also simultaneously issues of the kind we were discussing yesterday, issues of energy access, where we have notions of adequacy, providing enough of these services at an affordable price, in a manner that's efficient, and services that are modern. I mean, so the last one is really important for areas such as household energy. Uh, when put all together, it's, it's, a, it's a complex set of questions, uh, very daunting in some ways. And what we do understand now that uh, technology at least can play uh, an important role. It can't, can't uh, be a magic bullet, but can play an important role. In that context, what, how does one think about the technology needs of, of developing countries? And I would, I would posit that there are actually three, one can classify uh, these uh, needs in, in three categories. One is, uh, there's a range of technologies that already exist outside, uh, around, around the world. How do you modify and adapt those technologies and products in order to make them suitable for local preferences and operating environment? Local preferences may be actually retooling a car for what uh, uh, developing country, uh, the preferences of developing country consumers are, or uh, household appliances. Uh, an operating environment, for example, in India is very hot, so you have to think about how do you actually rework the compressors of air conditioners or power plants uh, in order to optimize them somewhat for the much higher operating conditions, just to give an example. Uh, the second category is something that I think we uh, is, is very pertinent to the discussion we had yesterday, which is that when you're talking about uh, products and services for the bottom of the pyramid, uh, the standard uh, technological market does not cover this because uh, globally the technology markets are really driven by market requirements. And the bottom of the pyramid, uh, with apologies to, uh, to Mr. Prahlad, uh, is not as attractive for, for uh, corporations, uh, even though in aggregate it's a pretty large market. But uh, questions such as, um, uh, the disaggregation of the market, the high transaction costs, and so on, really do not make it a very attractive market. And so, so there's, there's a gap uh, in terms of the existence of technologies that may, that may uh, help us uh, meet some of these problems. And the last one is thinking about longer term, longer term needs. Well, if you want to do that, so if those are the energy and climate needs and those are the technology needs, what does it tell us about innovation needs for, for developing countries? So I think let's start with some, some facts in, in a matter of speaking. Uh, innovation systems in developing countries are rather weak, uh, or actually non-existent, uh, non-existent in many countries. But even in a country such as India, uh, despite the hype, I would actually still classify innovation system as, as relatively weak. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, there's limited interest by commercial actors in markets, since for, for the reasons mentioned there. And the last point I think I'd like to really emphasize that while most of the conversation around innovation uh, needs is really on the, the front part of the innovation cycle, which is about developing technologies. In countries, developing countries, the deployment capabilities to deploy at scale become very important because that is what is going to give us uh, traction on the objectives that we want, which are 
uh, protection of the environment as well as the other social uh, and other benefits that come out of uh, providing a basic services. So the at scale question becomes, becomes a, uh, uh, an easy one. And, and I emphasize that because there's no shortage of pilot projects in any of these areas, but they've not made uh, much, or much headway in tackling the kind of problems, again, we were talking about yesterday where we were saying that the numbers of people, for example, without electricity or uh, without access to clean household energy have really stayed constant over the next 20 years and are expected to stay constant uh, in, in the absence of dramatic uh, deviations from business as usual. So uh, I think what that leads me to, to, to suggest is that we have to go beyond the, the standard conversations on technology transfer uh, and really think about what does it mean to enhance climate innovation in, in developing countries. Uh, and what I would say is that uh, it should focus, picking up on the, on the last slide, it should focus both on the availability and the implementability of technologies. And I'll come back to this implement implementability question again. Because uh, I think uh, at least my research in India shows that it's not the notion of implementing at large numbers is not a trivial problem. Um, <clears throat> these capabilities obviously should be shaped by local needs and rooted in the local context, the local social, cultural, economic, institutional context, uh, and to meet developmental and climate challenges. Uh, all of this is getting to be a little bit, you know, we can, we can see this becoming to be kind of a, a, a tough problem. And in the end, obviously, you would like to be able to uh, meet, meet, our challenge, meet the challenges in developing countries both effectively and efficiently, not just for the short term, but also for the long term. So that's having uh, kind, of, kind of laid out what we want. I'm going to talk about a particular a mechanism that, or particular uh, institutional approach that uh, I actually um, had developed along with some, actually, I guess, uh, in parallel with some colleagues in the UK at the Carbon Trust, Michael Grubb and some of his colleagues. Uh, and this is the notion that we now call climate innovation centers, which uh, really uh, kind of starts from a developing country perspective and say, what would it mean to uh, enhance uh, the innovation capabilities of these countries to, to be able to uh, play a more um, uh, to, to be able to move to be able to move these processes more uh, more effectively forward, um, and this is pretty much exactly what, what I said. It it uh, is informed and driven by both development and climate needs, shaped by local context, takes a broad yet nuanced view of innovation, uh, and and this is very important. This is very important because. Um, as we get deeper into it, we realize that in order to um, develop or even deploy a technology, uh, the kind of capabilities and the innovation gaps that exist are different among countries. So if I'm just thinking about deploying solar power for rural applications in India, the kind of innovation gaps one, and the requirements one uh, sees may be very different from what one sees in Kenya because the differences in the local context. And at the same time, within India, if you look across technologies, the gaps become very different when you look across solar power and biomass cookstoves, for example. So it's, it's, it's this understanding of the fact that you really have to think about innovation uh, capabilities from the point of view of understanding the innovation gaps that are specific to that particular technology or a particular technology in a particular national context. That is the nuance that I think is absolutely critical. And lastly, ideally, one would like to be able to leverage and marry local and global experiences on, on these kind of, uh, these kind of uh, areas. Uh, that's why I say not mere technical consultancies. I think that's, to my, my mind, a kind of a worry about the CTCNN. Uh, in fact, I think that's, it's for, for lack of time, I'm not going to be able to go into, into the, uh, kind of the international politics of climate change. But this notion of the climate innovation centers uh, actually, which I, uh, worked with the Indian government to, to kind of refine and, and was proposed by the Indian government in the climate negotiations, uh, effectively um, uh, was not eventually uh, picked on. And I think the CTCNN uh, was, was taken as the more, uh, I should say, the more acceptable approach. Uh, in, in large part, I, uh, my understanding is because there are some countries, especially the US, that did not want uh, uh, anything to do with innovation. In, in part of the technology mechanism because that would have been politically unsuitable in that, in that country. At least that's, that's what I've heard uh, uh, on, the, on the margins. I don't know if it's actually true because I was not in those negotiation rooms. But, uh, but the CDCNN, I think, uh, in, in, in the way it's designed, has a very tough act in terms of being able to 
to do all that it's supposed to do through that kind of a centralized model. I think to my view, the kind of way making progress, one has to think about these uh, questions at a much more decentralized level. So in fact, the notion of the Climate Innovation Center really was at a local or regional level, uh, a kind of a distributed model, uh, a decentralized model that really uh, uh, grew out of the local and regional kind of understanding of what was happening. I'm going to skip the previous slide because that's a kind of standard one. Uh, but I think I just put up, uh, um, and this I think relates to something that uh, Helene just put up, which is the kind of different things you have to do for successful innovation. You have to think about what's happening within the firm. And each of these, just to go back for a second, I mean, this is the kind of the standard uh, linear model. We know that model is not completely correct, but uh, if even it stays that, each of those pieces represents going down the innovation chain. And you can see that the technology, the firm, finance, the market and policy, all of those actually change. Those requirements change as you go down the innovation chain. So one actually has to think about each of these pieces specific to a technology, specific at the point of the innovation chain, and then think about the full cycle. Uh, again, not, not a trivial thing to do, but in some sense necessary because all of these pieces have to come together if innovation is to be complete. So one has to think about all of these journeys across the whole innovation cycle for a particular technology in a particular national context. Uh, and so what are the kind of activities that in a sense then should be undertaken by these kind of innovation centers? Uh, again, I just provide some examples of, of what they need to do in each, of these, in each of these areas. And I want to highlight a point here. Uh, uh, the point of the Climate Innovation Center here is not to be the central actor in terms of engaging in technology uh, research or engaging in policy making, but it is much more to coordinate, to facilitate, to make sure there's an understanding of the innovation gaps and to be able to mobilize the resources working with other actors. So in some sense, the innovation center model is a model of a coordinated partnership. It's not a model of an institution that's that's in a sense engaging in all the innovation activities. It's, it's a model of, of uh, an institution that has an understanding of the, of the constellation of actors and is able to organize them and mobilize them in a way that is able to achieve the desired objective. I'm going to skip that. So, so what, what are the key design features? As I've already highlighted, the gaps will differ from technology to technology and country to country, but uh, therefore, you know, Flexibility becomes the key. Uh, as I said, local international engagement with a range of actors that can actually help you fill these gaps. Uh, and a uh, question really is uh, ensuring that there's a focus on scalable opportunities. Uh, and to my mind, this is kind of a thinking that has to be somewhat new. One of the questions when we were talking about the innovation center model is whether this should be within the existing institutions or new. And I think that these, these institutions do need to be new so that they can actually not become captive to existing institutional interests, but are really able to do this kind of facilitating, coordinating function from the outside, supporting, not competing with existing actors. Uh, I'm going to skip this, uh, but just to quickly put out the point that I think, uh, falling from what I said earlier, it also helps, helps you, uh, helps one understand that different countries may have different innovation centers that look different because the requirements, the needs in those countries will become very, very different. So if you take, uh, I just did a simple classification of different countries here, but um, uh, for lack of time, I'm not going to go into this in more detail. I'm happy to talk about this later on. Um, so uh, I think the bottom line really is that while technology offers great potential in meeting these kind of challenges, realizing the potential is not trivial. I think that's the reason why we've had efforts for many, many years in many of these areas, but we've not been able to make the kind of headway that's needed <coughs> in many of the development challenges. And I think increasingly, we're also beginning to understand the complexities of the climate challenges. Uh, so we, we do need different ways of thinking about how to overcome the current constraints. Uh, uh, and as I said, the CICs is one model. The Innovation Centers is one model to talk about that. But it really is not necessarily the only way to organize for innovation, but at least to me, it's one way of thinking about how, uh, how to how to organize about innovation. And uh, what I want to do in one minute, actually, 
is, is to just give a couple of examples, actually, from uh, work we've been doing in India, looking at a couple of examples of successful deployment of uh, energy efficient technologies at scale. Some very interesting work has been going on, and I want to give two very quick examples. One on the dissemination of CFLs in India, where the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, uh, in a sense, I mean, I, I look at the Bureau of Energy Efficiency because some of the work that it's been doing is effectively the same as what a climate innovation center would be doing. It actually has a bird's eye view perspective, tries to understand what is it that it needs to do in a particular area, for example, in terms of energy efficient lighting, what's the technology that they want to actually deploy, and then organize the, the, uh, the actors around that. So here, in, 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 in they realize that these are very expensive, so they wanted to leverage uh, international finance, so they thought about CDM, but in order to do CDM, they needed to, at least in the initial conception, monitor the use of these, of these, um, uh, of the, of these CFLs, and so they actually uh, put out an RFP to develop a technology that can monitor the use of these bulbs through some kind of a GSM monitoring chip. Uh, they actually went out and partnered with existing suppliers to think about production and delivery chains, and also then uh, evolved the policy such that it was responsive to the needs. Uh, and similarly, it did a whole range of things on appliance, appliance standards and labeling. I'm out of time, so I'm going to skip that. But the point I want to make here is that B, in some sense, was working as what you would call in engineering, a systems operator. It was actually operating to increase the efficiency of the system and, and move actors around and entrain new actors and change the institutional context in a way that it was able to drive deployment in the direction that it was needed. And it has done it rather successfully, actually. Um, um, and I, I want to just put up this. So I have a couple of major reports on this. Uh, uh, one is for InfoDev, which is taking the Innovation Center's idea forward with support from DFID and other, other organizations. Uh, I think their intention is to put up 30 climate innovation centers in different parts of the world. So the report on the left was kind of the, the background report for this. And the follow-up of that that I worked did was some work that I did for climate strategies. Both of those are available publicly and create much uh, uh, contain much more detail about this, about this idea. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you very much.